Thanks very much, Rafa, for the introduction. Thanks very much for inviting me, and thanks very much for being here. So, yes, second nature geography, trade and productivity. Second nature geography refers um, not to things that happen exactly in your country, to the geography in your country, but the geography around your country. You will see in a second how uh, this is uh, going to be made uh, more precise. So that's the second nature geography. The hmm is because uh, anybody who's following this literature must be wondering where is that literature now? What was the conclusion? What did they actually find in the end? Because it's one of those literatures where there was a contribution and then six months afterwards there was a paper that said the opposite and it's been going uh, back and forth for quite a while like that. And I just wanted to uh, look back uh, at that literature with some uh, new data. And finally, a progress report, because I'm not uh, totally uh, done yet. This is a very uh, data-intensive project. And to cover all uh, the possibilities, it takes an incredible amount uh, of time. So although I've been working on it for more than uh, one and a half years, I'm still not done. OK, so what's the to-do here? Um, I'm going to first start out with a timeline of previous results. Um, then I'm going to explain very briefly why I'm going at that uh, topic again. And the key is that there is a lot more data and there's a lot better data to address the issue. I'll explain that data. And then uh, there's uh, my uh, empirical results, specifications and results. I have C, D, E, F. I could have gone G, H, and so on and so forth because there's so many uh, possibilities. Uh, there's so many things to check. So um, don't get nervous, I'll spend a lot of time on A, uh, because basically the empirical approaches, the ideas, um, they are uh, in the previous uh, literature. So I'm going to use that not just to explain you the previous literature, but basically I'm going to use it also to set out the methodology, and that's uh, then going to be applied with the new uh, data. So this is my starting point. My starting point is a very, uh, very, very influential um, contribution by Franklin Romer, which is now a few years back, and it's called Does Trade Cause Growth? And Franklin and Romer, they basically tackled a, a classical uh, problem. And the classical problem is this. Uh, many people believe that international trade uh, somehow raises incomes and, and productivity. That would be the... the um, the green arrow that I have here on, on that slide. But in order to establish that green arrow, in order to establish this causality, you somehow have to take uh, care of that feedback effect in red. Uh, all, almost everybody thinks that countries that are richer, that countries that have higher income, will uh, automatically uh, trade more through the demand side, for example. So that was the problem that they were facing. They said, how can I identify this green arrow, get rid of that uh, red arrow? And basically, the idea that they had is quite simple, but I think quite powerful then and still quite powerful now. The idea that they had is the following. They said, look, um, a part of trade is going to be uh, determined by uh, trade uh, costs of all types of uh, um, of all kinds and all types. And these trade costs, they're going to depend, at least to some extent, we'll have to see whether it's uh, strong enough, on uh, your relative geography. And with that, that's the second nature geography. With that, I mean your distance to other countries, especially to other populous countries. So uh, their idea is to exploit this in order to find an instrumentation strategy uh, to identify the effect of international trade on income per capita or productivity. Now, what's the detail of their approach? The detail of their approach is the following. It basically consists of three steps. In the first step, they use a lot, for those uh, times, a lot of bilateral trade data, about 3,200 observations, to estimate a bilateral gravity equation with the key feature that on the right-hand side of that bilateral gravity equation, you just have geography, distance to other country, and the populations of these countries. You don't have things that, for example, reflect uh, technology, reflect institutions. So what you can see here is what you're estimating. We're in Spain right now. You're estimating the trade intensity imports uh, into Spain uh, from, let's say, France 
exports from Spain to France over Spanish GDP, and you're relating that uh, to the distance uh, to France to the population of uh, Spain and the population of France. And then you do that with Spain and France, Spain and Germany, Spain and Peru, Spain and Singapore, Spain and New Zealand. Uh, and what you did for Spain, you're going to repeat for Germany, you're going to repeat for Uruguay. Uh, in total, 3, 000, uh, about 3,000 pairs. With that regression, you end up with these coefficient B, C, D, and there's some other coefficients. They're always attached to things that are pure geography. B, C, D. Now, with these coefficients, you can predict, once you have B, C, D, uh, you can predict the bilateral trade of any two countries, the bilateral trade that will be based on geography. So the key here is that you see that you can also predict the bilateral trade between two countries that were not in the sample to start out with. So, for example, between Hong Kong and Venezuela. Let's say that you didn't have any trade data for Hong Kong or Venezuela, but with the right-hand side of this regression, you can predict that. Uh, then you aggregate up. That's um, the next step that you do. Let's again go for the case of Spain. You aggregate up the predicted trade intensity of Spain with all countries in the world. And you can do that now really for all countries in the world because this is the predicted trade intensity based on this regression. That gives you the geo trade variable for Spain. You do the same thing for France, for Peru, for Uruguay, and so on. Once you've done that, everything else is sort of standard instrumental variable econometrics. So this is the next slide. You end up with two equations, the main equation of interest. I've put in some detail here because this equation will repeat itself, and the first stage equation. Now, the main equation of interest on the left-hand side, you have income per capita, the log. We uh, usually uh, take the log form here. And on the right-hand side, you have stuff, especially a lot of stuff in these controls. And the key thing here is that you have this international trade intensity as it is traditionally measured, which is imports uh, into Spain, exports from Spain over Spanish GDP. So what you want to figure out is the causal effect of this, on income per capita, the marginal effect here is called beta, and the first stage equation, which is the way you take a care of the endogeneity of this openness, international trade openness measure, is here. So here you have this geo-trade measure that was uh, constructed. So you can see that uh, the approach is really simple. It's a standard instrumental variable approach. The key is, comes a little bit earlier. That was sort of the brilliant idea. Um, of uh, Frankel and Romer. Uh, so Frankel and Romer then go out and implement that approach. They implemented it for 1985, the Pan World Table uh, version 5. That was the latest data available at that moment in time. They have different samples. They focus on very large samples. Uh, they don't select countries much. I've already told you that they're working with relatively little gravity data. I'm making a big deal out of that because it's going to matter for me later. So in particular, I'm giving you here the following statistic. The 3,200 uh, data um, observations that they use for the, gravity, uh, uh, for the gravity estimation cover only 50% of the bilateral trades in the sample that they use to estimate the effect on income. Okay? So uh, there may be an issue here of uh, this geogravity actually representing the broader picture in their um, data. What do they find? Well, the, the finding section of that paper reads really uh, funny uh, because uh, the main section with all the tables says that trade has a large effect on income per capita, and then there come a series of robustness, and the first robustness check <laughs> that they do where they control for direct effects of geography by putting in simply the continents where countries are as additional control variables. That's the first robustness check that they do, yields that trade is insignificant. So basically we have a very good idea here, but their own robustness checks suggest that, well, it doesn't seem to be doing that well in period. Immediately afterwards, there was uh, additional skepticism going in the same direction by Rodriguez and Roderick. So 1999, in the year 2000, already we have this paper published by Rodriguez and Roderick, and they basically go in the same uh, direction 
of uh, non-robustness that had already been in part documented by Frankel and Romer. Namely, they, you do, they put in additional so-called first nature geography variables, controls in the same framework. So here uh, we have the Frankel and Roma framework. So we have income per capita, the effect of trade openness instrumented the way we uh, just uh, went over. And I had already told you that as additional control variables, Frankel and Roma had tried just putting in the continents where countries are and that that already yielded some non-robustness. Now Rodriguez and Roderick, they put in two additional first nature geography, geography in your country variables, and those are distance to the equator, which has become a very standard summary measure of first nature geography and the share of land that you have in the tropics. And what they also found is that uh, Frankel and Romer's finding of the effect of second nature geography on income per capita through trade was non-robust. Now what I want to point out here is that they actually used the same data as Frankel and Roma. In particular, they used the same gravity sample as Frankel and Roma. They used their data exactly. So there was no additional data. We still have a situation where the second nature geography estimation is based on 15% of the bilateral trades that we could uh, potentially have in our productivity. Now, in parallel to this literature, I mean, they really um, went ahead in parallel uh, universe, there was the institutions and cross-country income uh, literature. So we had just the uh, literature on geography, especially second nature geography and the cross-country income distribution. This is all going to be about the forces that shape the cross-country income distribution. And in parallel, we had this institution's uh, literature. Now, the two main... Uh, Contribution in this literature, you certainly know, they've been incredibly uh, influential uh, with an uh, incredible amount, uh, number of, of sites. The first one was by Hall and Jones, which is often seen as the shakier of the two main contributions. Let me explain it anyway, because uh, I will build uh, in part on Hall and Jones also. That paper was called, Why is Output, so much, Output Per Worker So Much Larger in Some Countries Than Others? And basically, the setup, the IV setup and the empirical framework that they were using was the same as Franklin and Romer. So what they're trying to figure out here is the effect on output per worker of institutional quality. Institutional quality they measure as the survey response to four or five questions that have to do with corruption, protection of uh, property rights, uh, bureaucratic uh, quality, things like that. But obviously, you know, here there's going to be a feedback uh, a feedback mechanism, and there's also going to be an omitted variable uh, concern. So what do they do? Well, they basically develop a series of variables which they argue are okay instruments. They actually, you know, they don't say that, even in the paper, they don't say they're great instruments, but they say that they are um, okay instruments. So okay instruments here uh, are supposed to be things that affect output per worker only through institutional quality. They don't have a direct uh, effect. So that's the basic framework that they use. And the question here, um, and, and uh, sorry, uh, that's the uh, framework that they use in the picture. That's the framework that they use uh, in uh, equations. And you can see the equations are basically parallel to what we saw in the trade and uh, productivity literature. And I'm going to build on that uh, element of, uh, of uh, parallel development. So we have a main equation where we're analyzing the effect on income per capita output per worker. Here the main uh, variable of interest is this institutional quality. We're trying to control for many things here. And we have this first stage equation uh, that relates the endogenous institutional quality to instruments. Now, of course, you're all wondering now, what are those instruments? And, you know, this is probably where the weakness of this paper lies. I think the strength of this paper is that it brought out this idea of institutional quality as a summary measure. It also brought out this idea of instrumentation. When you look at the actual instruments being used, well, they used as instruments for institutional quality, distance from the equator, the fraction of the population speaking uh, European at birth, and actually the log of geo trade of Frankel and Roma, that variable that we just saw. Now, you can see why they might have uh, thought of these variables as being uh, 
possible instruments. For example, distance from the equator is correlated with climate zones, and there is a strong argument that Europeans, when they colonized uh, countries, they tended to stay longer or, or, or make stronger routes in places that had a similar climate than Europe. Fraction of the population speaking European at birth, that's an exposed measure of European influence in that country, so that may also be related to how institutions are transplanted. At the same time, you don't need to think much to see also the weaknesses of this instrument. And um, so what Hall and Jones uh, try to do there is they try to convince us based on tests of over-identifying restrictions. They have more than one instrument, so basically they can check whether uh, the, uh, the over-identifying restrictions uh, hold. But as I said, these uh, instruments were not absolutely convincing on conceptual grounds. The more convincing paper uh, that has actually stand, uh, stood up quite well to uh, very extensive uh, um, research, uh, uh, reanalysis, um, is the paper by Asimoglu, Johnson, and Robinson. And here I can be very quick because the framework is exactly the same as that of uh, Hall and Jones. It's just that they focus on property rights protection as the main institutional quality variable. And as instruments, they bring out this variable, the log of historic settler mortality in former colonies, which they have for 64 countries. I think many of you know the story of that variable. So this is a variable um, that they uh, constructed from historical sources, and it reflected the probability of European settlers to die within the first few years in different countries that were potential uh, colonies. Now, the reason why that makes a potential instrument is that the diseases that actually killed the Europeans or the conditions that actually killed the Europeans were conditions that often were very specific to Europeans. Uh, they actually didn't affect the natives for a variety of reasons. And the other reason is that, surprisingly, Europeans were actually quite well informed about these settler mortalities when they made the decision where to go. So you can see that if these two uh, conditions hold, then what you might get is that where settler mortality was high, Europeans were less likely to go. There was less likely to be a mass of Europeans that would transplant European-type uh, institutions into uh, these col colonies. And if uh, the reason of why these uh, institutions were less likely to be transplanted, if those reasons didn't have any direct effect on income, productivity and, on income and productivity after 100 and 200 years, then you could use it as an instrument, and that's what they did. So at this point, uh, we have these parallel uh, literatures. We have trade, we have institutions, and of course, the logical thing is to uh, bring the two together and to see you know, uh, what happens uh, to second nature geography once we consider the role of institutions, and also to what extent is institutions, are institutions basically capturing the advantages of second nature geography. And surprisingly enough, the two papers that actually were trying to bring these two uh, things together, both came out of Spain. Um, let me first tell you the, the framework that both papers sort of use. Not exactly the same framework, but uh, it goes in that direction. That's basically the framework. So you have income per capita, and on the left-hand side, you have trade openness, and you have an idea there for instrumentation. And the instrumentation has to do with the relative or second nature geography, with, where, with the population of your neighbors, how far you are from populous countries. On the right-hand side, you have the role of property rights protection or rule of law. That's what I'm going to focus on. That's uh, what's being used nowadays as the main measure of institutional quality. And you have an idea for instrumentation here depending on the sample. So if you go for the small samples uh, of Asimoglu, Johnson, and Robinson, you have the instrument that is pretty widely accepted. If you go for the large sample, the best you can do is Euro language. Uh, as an instrument for um, property rights protection. Now, I already told you, ah, there's one more thing. That's the danger with these moving, with these moving slides. There's one more thing. There's another idea at that moment out there that was sort of pretty obvious, and somebody had to do it, which is uh, the second nature geography estimation was based on very little data. 
So potentially what you had here was not very representative for the second nature geography of the actual countries that were used in that part of the estimation. So the two uh, papers that, came, that uh, did that, um, that uh, actually went in that direction, both came out of uh, um, Spain, I should say. Both were done by people associated with Spain. The first paper uh, was by Noguer and Siscar. And you know, that paper had a title that gives away everything. It was called Trade Races Income, a Precise and Robust Result. So I mean, you didn't even have to read the abstract. Um, and the key thing there was that they brought a lot more data to, uh, to the table on the gravity estimation. So uh, all the papers that we've seen so far, they used only about 3,000 country pairs. They're using almost 9,000. That's the first thing. And the second thing that they also did uh, differently is that they did control for institutional quality in their regressions. They did uh, consider that, although they, didn't, they did not um, instrument it. So they considered institutional quality to be exogenous. That has uh, some disadvantages. And maybe the main disadvantage is that the institutional quality papers by Hall and Jones and Asimoglu, Johnson, and Robinson had found that when you instrumented institutional quality, the marginal effects were a lot stronger on income per capita. And so the argument that had started to settle in people's head was that if you didn't instrument, there was so much noise in the institutional quality measure that basically institutional quality didn't come out to be very strong because of that noise. So that noise here uh, would, of course, work against institutional quality and therefore leave more variation to be explained by second nature geography. In any case, what they found is extensive robustness of trade and second nature geography. And then there was a second paper also coming out of Spain that was uh, written by Paco Alcalá, who is in the audience, and myself. And we sort of had a very similar uh, approach. We also thought um, that more data had, be, had to be brought to this uh, issue, more trade data, to make the second nature geography estimation more representative. We, from the start, thought that you had to instrument uh, both institutions and trades to allow for a level playing field. We were aware, aware of the measurement of the measurement error uh, issue. And therefore, we needed to uh, rely on the institutional quality literature for instruments. And we did the best we can. I'll explain you some uh, more details. But there was one more thing in our paper that turned out to be uh, one more conceptual issue in our paper that turned out to be uh, crucial. I, I actually still remember the day when Paco came into my office and started talking about this. Um, so uh, this is related to the measurement of openness. The standard measurement uh, of international trade openness is just imports plus exports over GDP. That makes a lot of sense. And that uh, measure is unitless. Because you know, whether you would have measured this thing in pesetas in the past Spain and this thing in pesetas or in German marks, um, it drops out. Both the top and the bottom of that ratio are measured in um, in the, same, in the same currency, so the currency drops out. Now, does that mean that this measure doesn't depend on prices anymore and is a quantity index of trade? This is what people were intending to do. They were intending to use this as a quantity index of trade. When openness is large, what it means is that the volume of the quantity of trade uh, is large. Does it mean that it's a quantity index? And the simple answer is that no. Uh, if you break up GDP at the bottom into traded and non-traded GDP, then the expression looks like that. In the bottom, you have traded GDP. This is a quantity. You have non-traded GDP. This is meant to be a quantity. And non-traded GDP gets multiplied by the relative price of non-traded goods, the relative price of haircuts relative to cars in your, in your country. Now, this relative price can really confuse the whole issue because of a balassa samuelson effect. The balassa samuelson effect, you know, says that the price of haircuts of non-traded goods is high in countries that are very uh, productive. And the idea is that you still want to have your hair cut. Productivity uh, in getting your hair cut doesn't vary much across country. Productivity in the automobile sector is much larger in some countries than others. So if you want to still get your hair cut in Germany, in Spain, and in France, the relative price of, um, of that has to be very high. That's the balassa samuelson effect. So the balassa samuelson effect, you can already see here that what it's going to do 
is if you have two countries that trade exactly the same quantities, uh, but one has a high relative price of non-traded goods and the other one has a low relative price, the country with the high relative price is going to look less open. That's not good. You want a quantity index. You don't want the country with a high relative price to look less open when it trades exactly the same. And there's a bigger problem which is more subtle uh, with this. And to illustrate this problem, let me show you this very simple model. Suppose that you think that lower trade costs raise uh, the productivity in the tradables goods sector and ultimately that raises income and productivity. And what you want to do is you want to verify this thing by using openness, the trade openness measure that we just saw as a summary measure of trade. Now what we have just seen is that basically the openness measure is going to be higher, of course, if you trade more. That's good. That's what we're trying to exploit when we work with openness. But it's going to be lower when the price of non-traded goods is higher. Now, that can be very bad, and it can be very bad for this reason. Consider now a case where trade costs are low. Of course, you're going to trade more, and openness is going to go up. So this channel here, going like this, this channel is going to reflect exactly what you want to capture. That's good. But there's going to be this trade-related balassa samuelson effect, which is very clearly there in the data, which is the following. When you trade costs are lower, productivity in tradables goes up, that drives up the price of non-traded goods, and that lowers your openness. So what can happen here in very simple models, I mean, you don't need to get very sophisticated, is that although there's a very clear positive causality going this way, when you work with openness as a summary measure, it's all gone. It's all confused and it's all gone. So this is why we proposed an alternative measure of uh, trade openness, which actually is quite simple. And I have to say that later uh, I realized that this is what's done, for example, to measure real investment uh, and real savings. So the alternative measure of real openness takes imports and exports of Spain in exchange rate dollars and it divides it by purchasing power dollar GDP. So as a result, purchasing power dollar uh, GDP, the idea there is that the GDP of every country is measured in the same price system. So if you now take this purchasing power uh, parity GDP and you write it as traded and non-traded, you get this expression down here. And the key thing is that the P here doesn't have a country index. This is an international P. So what did we find? Uh, what did Paco and I find when we did that? We actually found that openness, international trade openness, was a non-robust um, determinant of um, productivity and income. The non-robustness mostly showed once you control for institution, uh, but the non-robustness was clear. At the same time, when we used a real openness, and particularly the log of real openness, as a summary measure of international trade, the effect was very uh, robust. Now, you may say, the log of real openness, what is that? No? So let's talk a little bit about the log of real openness. So why did we use the log? I mean, we did a lot of thinking and a lot of econometrics, and um, basically it all ended up in this. There's two reasons to consider the log. The first is the classical issue that uh, sometimes you know that the effect is monotonically increasing, but you don't know, you know, how is it? Is it linear? Is it log? Is it quadratic? So the log is a possibility when the problem features decreasing returns, in this case decreasing returns to trade. So maybe increasing your trade openness a little bit at the low level has a bigger effect than if you're already very open. But of course the classical uh, explanation in econometrics to use the log is the second point here. It reduces the influence of large values and it's used a lot when distributions of variables are very right skewed because of that. Now, if you think about trade openness, you may say, okay, but that's not a good argument for trade openness because doesn't trade openness lie between zero and one? The answer is no, because trade is the total value of goods uh, and uh, GDP is value added. So trade openness conceptually can be larger than one. And if you just look at the data, you see that uh, quite a few countries have trade openness larger than one. And I'm gonna show you now the distributions here of uh, real openness on the left and the log of real openness on the right. And you see, I think, that real openness is really the classical variable where uh, 
econometric methodology tells you to use the log. Take a look at the left. I mean, this is a very right skewed distribution. The largest observation here is nine times the average. Take a look at the right, the log of real openness. What has happened? It's not that skewed. Uh, it's not quite normal, but it's not that skewed. Rafa, how am I doing in time? Because there is no left. So, um, so that was the reason why we were doing things the way uh, we were doing. Immediately uh, after uh, we uh, worked on that, uh, both, uh, both uh, uh, Paco and I, but also Nogue and Siskar, there was uh, a further expanded trade criticism paper by uh, Roderick, Subramanian, and uh, Trevi. And let me explain you a little bit of this because that paper also develops some things that are going to be interesting for me later and that I'm going to build on. The first thing is that that paper started working with three samples. So far, everybody had worked with the largest possible sample of countries. They also have that. That's the 137 country sample. But they brought in two samples that previous papers had not considered because mainly they thought they were too small. The first sample that they brought in is the Asimoglu Johnson Robinson 64 country sample. That's a very attractive sample because people are more convinced of the instrumentation strategy. So that makes it a priori very attractive. But 64 countries, that's a very small sample. And they actually discovered, uh, Roderick et al., they discovered that Asimoglu Johnson and Robinson, in their data set, they had the log of historic, they had historic settler mortality data for more than the 64 countries, for 80 countries. And so they also did everything for what they call an expanded Asimoglu Johnson Robinson data set. So we now ended up with three samples. We have the 64 Asimoglu Johnson Robinson, the expanded one, which uses data from Asimoglu Johnson and Robinson, and the largest uh, possible sample. And basically, uh, what uh, they argue, uh, based on uh, a finding, one finding in the 64 country sample, is that the effect of uh, trade is non-robust even when you consider the log of real openness. Although they really just have one specification with the log of real openness, it's not quite clear uh, what the specification is, so it's worthwhile to look back into this. So where are we? This is the summary of this very um, contorted route. So we have basically um, the papers in, in green that all work with a small gravity sample. So the second nature estimations could potentially be noisy. Uh, and basically, they all argue that there is some non-robustness there. Even Frankel and Roma, at the very beginning, they said, look, um, there may be some non-robustness to first nature geography, to what's happening in the country. Roderick et al., they basically say the non-robustness is with respect to institution, and they argue that institutions trumps everything, uh, including uh, trade, but also including uh, first uh, nature geography. And then we have these two papers that say uh, something else. They say um, the effect of second nature geography is uh, robust, and they work with much late, larger data sets. So that's the situation where we are, and uh, that's basically uh, where I stood at the beginning of the project. Uh, and at the beginning of the project, I also realized that now there was a lot more and a lot better data to address these issues. The first data development happened with the pen world tables. Now, here I'm showing you how the pen world table data has developed. The version 5, um, which is what most of the literature used uh, before, had 152 countries, but only for 63 of those countries, they had actually gone into the country and measured prices. All the other countries, the prices were imputed in one way or other. Now, I'm going to work with version 7, which is the version that has the largest uh, coverage. And here, basically, now we have all countries in the world. I couldn't quite figure out from Wikipedia that rapidly how many countries there are in the world, but we're seven or eight countries away. So uh, 189 countries. But what's more important, I think, here for me is that 146 countries have price, men have price benchmark data for a lot of products. So they went into these 146 countries and they actually collected the prices that is necessary to make things real, to construct these baskets, the price of these baskets, and to make uh, these uh, incomes um, Comparable. So if you compare this, you know, 63, 146, so there's been 
a big jump in the coverage of the data and the quality of the data. The same thing happened with the bilateral trade data. So we, I've already shown you that there is this, um, there is this first uh, three contributions that work with very, relatively little data. Then it was uh, Paco and I who had sort of the, the largest trade data set uh, up to 2004-2005. Uh, and nowadays, you have almost 26,000 uh, observations that you can work with. And here I show you the, the missing. I've always talked about the coverage. Here I'm showing you what, uh, how much data is missing relative to the maximum possible uh, data that you could have. So uh, Franklin and Romer, 84% of the countries that they were actually considering in their uh, main equation in their productivity analysis, 84%, they were not included in the bilateral trade data. Um, if you go to Roderick et al., it's 86%. Uh, I now stand in this latest at uh, 25%. So 75% of the potential trade relations in my data set are actually covered by my bilateral trade data. There's another measurement advantage, which is sort of um, Exciting. It turns out that it was a little bit less exciting than I was hoping once I looked at the data. And it had to do with the real openness measurement. It turned out that this real openness measurement that uh, Paco and I did, real openness A, which is imports and exports in exchange rate dollars divided by purchasing power GDP uh, in international dollars, that idea had sort of caught on. And the pen world tables uh, did a similar calculation, and they now have a measure of real openness in the pen world tables. Um, but the coverage is uh, much uh, is, is smaller, not always much smaller, but it is smaller than the coverage that, uh, that I can have for this real openness A data. So let me explain you the real openness B data. Basically, the, the real openness A data was relying on the law of one price for imports and exports. The idea is that you could measure the value of that stuff in exchange rate dollars because there was the law of one price that you know the uh, same mercedes car this uh, was a uh, mercedes car was selling for the same all around the globe now obviously that's not a bad starting point i think that you would all agree that's not a bad starting point but you can we also would all agree that there are other things going on like um, price international price discrimination so what the penwell table did now, is they use this real openness idea, but they basically develop price indices. That's super complex. I don't have time to get into that today, both for the imports of every country and for the exports of every country. So instead of relying on the law of one price, which is what we did up there, they actually go out there and they collect price data for imports and exports, and they get, you know, if you want, real, real openness. No, not just one real openness. So this is the situation where I was. Basically, these data improvements made me think, uh, plus the confusion that I felt uh, of what really had been going on, made me think that it was worthwhile to go uh, back to this. And now I'm already with my specifications here and my samples and my main results. So let me tell you a little bit about the specifications. Now, the full Monty in this literature is the case where you have uh, trade and institutions, and you instrument both. Now, this is an estimation with two endogenous variables and two instruments, and to make a long story short, that's complex, and a lot of things can go wrong. Uh, so I'm going to do that. Um, it turns out that, uh, at least in some specifications, not all the things that could go wrong go wrong. I'll tell you that. But in addition, what I will do is I will stop a step earlier, and I'll offer you results that I call semi-instrumental variable estimation, where what I do is I instrument institutions as well as it can be done, as well as it is currently done in the literature in a cross-country uh, setting, and then I just bring in the log of geotrade, this uh, second nature trade variable, I just bring it in as a direct uh, additional variable that potentially affects income per capita. So I try to parcel out the institution stuff in an instrumentation way, and then I just look directly at the effect of second nature geography to um, cut through these complexities that arise when you do the full monty of instrumenting everything. I have three samples now. That makes the presentation a little bit uh, uh, lengthy. Um, I have the Asimoglu-Johnson-Robinson sample, 
uh, where I have this instrument for institution, settler mortality. I have the extended Asimoglu Johnson Robinson sample. Um, and I have the largest possible sample, 189 country, which I want to do because I want to cover the world. But of course, I am aware that here uh, is where I have the weakest the, the weakest case for the instrument. So let me show you uh, my results. So I have results for trade, uh, first stage for trade. So does second nature geography predict trade? I have results first stage for institutions. Does settler mortality European language drive institutions? And then I'm going to go at the main equations. C3 is my semi-IV, where I instrument institutions, but I put in GeoTrade directly. C4 is the full Monty, and you just, you know, you push the button, you pray, you see what happens. And uh, I'll give you sort of a sense of which results are better, which are worse. So the determinants of trade, uh, the first uh, regression that I'm going to run is I'm going to take the real openness measure as Paco and I developed it, and I'm going to use that as a left-hand side variable, and the right-hand side variable, I'm going to use what people uh, use and what is sensible to use. So let me explain you a little bit in more detail the structure of this table because all the tables are going to look sort of the same. So at the bottom here, um, this is what I call the baseline specifications. I have the baseline controls for geography. So I have distance from the equator, which is what Roderick said was blowing things apart. And I have the continents here, which is what uh, the continents that uh, uh, Franklin and Roma thought that were making uh, things blow apart. In the top, I have the more interesting things. So I have the measure of geo trade, this uh, second nature measure of trade. And I have here whatever instrument I'm using in the sample. The samples here are first column, small Asimoglu Johnson Robinson, extended Asimoglu Johnson Robinson, largest possible sample. And what's important here is that you realize that GeoTrade, the second nature geography measure of trade, although it is incredibly rough, I mean, it is really very rough, you're just predicting trade based on distance from other countries, populous countries, it has a very strong and significant effect on uh, actual trade. And this coefficient is now an elasticity, so it says for every 100% uh, increase in this geotrade measure, you get a 30, roughly 30, 25 to 30% increase in uh, trade. Okay, so this is the first stage for trade. Now, um, I'm also going to show you that it doesn't really matter much whether you use the more sophisticated real, real openness measure or the less sophisticated openness measure for this work. And how am I going to do that? I'm going to rerun exactly the same regression, but on the left-hand side, I'm going to use the log gap between the two trade openness measures and rerun exactly the same regression. And when I do that, my main variables, which is the geotrade variable and the instruments for institutions, they come in totally insignificant. What does that mean? It means that any discrepancy between the less sophisticated trade measure and the more sophisticated real trade openness measure, any discrepancy is not correlated with the, with the, with the second nature geography variable or with the uh, instruments for institutions. Rafa, how am I doing with time? Okay. So um, determinants of the rule of law, so I'm a little bit short of time. So here, let me just uh, show you uh, the table more quickly. Basically, the first, uh, the fir the m of most interest is this uh, row here. And what this row basically says is that settler mortality or Euro language, as they did in Asimoglu, Johnson and Robinson and Holland Jones, they have a strong effect on institutional quality and it goes in the direction that it went there. So now I'm going to this semi-IV regression. Okay, the semi-IV means that I'm going to um, instrument rule of law and I'm gonna put in geotrade just as is, right? Uh, there's an issue here of, on, on the standard errors, but uh, if you think about the null hypothesis of no effect of geotrade, you're fine. These standard errors are fine. And basically what you get here is you get, uh, what I'm going to focus on is rule of law that's instrumented and log of geotrade, that's just a variable in there. 
And what you get is that rule of law has a strong and significant effect, although I forgot the stars here, in all three samples, Asimoglu-Johnson, extended Asimoglu-Johnson, largest sample. And what's more interesting for me, that's the key thing, geotrade always enters uh, significantly and with a strong effect, I argue. To give you a sense of the strong effect, consider this table. Here I'm asking me uh, my, the question, uh, given the coefficients in the previous table, if I move geotrade from the 33rd to the 66th percentile, for example, what's the effect on income per capita? And you can see that the effect depends a little bit on the sample. Let's just focus on the Asimoku, Jones, and Robinson sample because it's seen as the one with the best uh, instrumentation for institutional quality, and the effects are sizable. I mean, going from the 33rd to 66th percentile in terms of re relative geography raises your income by 50%. If you go from the worst geography to the best, to almost worst, almost best, we're talking about uh, multiplying your income per capita by a factor of two and a half. So you can also do the full IV thing. I'm going to skip that. It comes out fine. Trade does fine. All the tests uh, of uh, instrument weakness do okay. Um, I'm just going to skip over that because I want to show you some other, other things. The first thing I want to show you is that, of course, uh, you may wonder whether these baseline controls for geography are enough. So uh, I went out there and I considered all the geography variables that the previous literature had used. In particular, I don't know whether you're aware of that, Asimoglu, Johnson, and Robinson really considered a wide array of geography, geography variables. They're all here. So there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of variables. Uh, and they're all sensible variables. I mean, you think about that, and for every variable, there is a story. I mean, these are not variables that are picked out of the, out of the dark, that are pit, picked from the, from the nothing. So I put them in, a, in my semi-IV uh, re regression. So uh, remember, semi-IV means that rule of law is instrumented. Geotrade is in there um, as is. Um, and I get that they don't move uh, the geotrade variable at all. The geotrade, this relative geography variable, has uh, almost the same effect with all this extended control than it had before. Um, I also did, I'm going to skip that, I also did something that uh, I was very um, unsure of, but in the end I, I ran it, is I put in these regional dummies for Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and East Asia, basically just because it's tradition and people have been putting them in. I really hate them because I think that they're picked with a lot of intention. I cannot see you know, what uh, is the exogenous variation that's captured by that. The results are robust. I have a few minutes left, and in, I think in the few minutes left, I want to show you uh, something uh, different. So uh, basically, the identification of this effect of trade, of second nature geography uh, through trade, is through uh, the relative geography of a country, through this uh, spatial structure that we have around the world. You know that some countries are really far away from populous countries and some are very close. Now, you could say, okay, this uh, proximity ultimately could affect a country's uh, productivity or income through other channels, and you know I would be the first uh, to admit that that uh, might be true. And the two, f uh, the two main other channels that come to mind is immigration and FDI. I should say that come to mind and that can be tested. Now, um, so uh, if you if you have that concern, what you can do is you can go out there and basically deal with these variables in exactly the same way I dealt with trade and check uh, whether those variables are um, significant. So in particular, you can use this geography, this second nature geography approach to instrument uh, for immigration or develop a geographic immigration variable and you can do the same thing for FDI. FDI I'm going to forget because I find no, no evidence and the literature finds uh, no evidence that FDI is related to proximity. I'm going to focus on immigration. Now, very quickly. You know that that was the instrumentation idea of Frankel and Romer. They had this bilateral trade data, they regressed it on these geographic characteristics, they summed it up and they obtained a geotrade variable. You can do exactly the same with bilateral migration data. So you look at Spain, you uh, check how many uh, Peruvians, French, uh, Germans, people from Iceland are in Spain, and you regress the intensity of immigrants from those countries on the same distance variables 
that you used in the trade equation. You get the predictions, you sum it up, you have this geo-immigration variable. Now, what's very surprising here uh, is that the, when you then do the first stage analysis for trade, you get that geo-trade, so this is a first stage uh, table on the left-hand side, I have trade openness. What you get is that geo-trade, as I have constructed it, matters exactly in the same way as before for trade, but geo-immigration doesn't matter for trade at all. Totally insignificant here. When I do the same analysis for immigration, I get the opposite pattern. So, so far, so good. There seems to really be some interesting content in these geo-variables. This is for immigration. Now, geo-trade matters here a little bit, but then it goes away. But geo-immigration, the immigration variable constructed based on this relative uh, second nature geography, it matters, it comes in significant. So it seems to work. There is a geography that matters for immigration, there is a geography that matters for trade. Now when you put geo-trade and geo-immigration together in my semi-IV table, what I always get is that geo-trade stays unaffected, its word was before, and geo-immigration doesn't matter. So what I'm telling here is that the instrumentation strategy works. There is a geography for immigration that appears to be separate from the geography from trade. But when you use these two geographies together, it seems to be trade that matters more. So I'm done. Thanks, Rafa, for your patience. Uh, that's the summary. Thanks.